Before starting, uh, let me uh, welcome everybody again to this webinar, which is the second of the triple open science training series, which is organized by VP6 of the triple project. Today, uh, we will have uh, Luca DeSantis of Net7 of, as a moderator of this session. So I give the floor to Luca for some introductory words. And uh, yeah, so please, Luca. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Francesca. So this is uh, the uh, new webinar in the Open Science Training series of the Triple Project. It is dedicated to the EOSC onboarding. As you all know, EOSC is uh, for the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, before we start, I just uh, I remind you that uh, this is not the first, not the last event in the training series. There is uh, another uh, webinar uh, next month, again on the EOSC, the State of the Art and Perspectives, which will be um, presented by our um, project manager, Suzanne Dumuchel. In general, to be informed about the training events uh, in uh, Triple, or you can uh, visit the page that is listed below. And some housekeeping rules today before we start. The session is recorded and will be made available afterwards, again on uh, the same uh, uh, triple page about, about training events. So if you're interested, you can go in a couple of days uh, and check the link. And uh, there is a QA session, which is uh, foreseen at the end of the presentation by Kasten and Joshua. So questions are very welcome. Please post them in the chat and I will take care of uh, collecting them and present them uh, at the end to our speakers. So before we start, uh, why in Triple we are so interested in the European Open Science Cloud? It's interesting to see how Triple is positioned um, in relation to other European projects and initiatives. So first of all, Triple is a service of OPERAS, which is the infrastructure for open scholarly communication dedicated to the SSH domain. Triple has a, a quite rich partnerships uh, partnership and amongst uh, the, the partners, there are four infrastructures, the Clarion, uh, Daria, EGI and SESDA. And the latter participates to the EOSC Enhanced project, which is devoted to enhancing, to contribute to the um, in, uh, uh, exp uh, exp uh, expansion, uh, let's say, of the European Open Science Cloud. And Triple will feature in the Opera, Opera uh, European Open Science Cloud, and it will also feature in Shock, which is uh, the marketplace uh, devoted to the social sciences and humanities. In general, um, all the uh, EOSC uh, um, services dedicated to SSH will be harvested and presented in the Shock marketplace as well. When I say that Triple uh, will feature in the Shock and the EOS Cloud, actually I'm mentioning both the Go Triple platform, so the main outcome of the project, but also its innovative services. As some of you know, or many of you know, I guess, um, there is a, a specific work package in uh, Triple, work package five that I'm leading, which is dedicated to the development of innovative services that will enhance uh, the discovery platform Go Triple. Okay, now it's time to present our speakers, Kasten and Joshua. Kasten uh, is the Chief Technical Officer at SESDA, and he's in charge of defining the technical and the strategic roadmap uh, of the SESDA infrastructure, both from a technical viewpoint and a strategic, as I say, uh, viewpoint regarding especially the long-term sustainability of the infrastructure itself. Joshua is a Technical Officer at SESDA, he responsible for maintaining, supporting, and documenting the infrastructure. And also he takes care of the development, test, and production environment of SESDA. So the main goal of today's webinar is to answer the question how a service provider can uh, onboard, can uh, register um, the service on the EOSC marketplace, and especially what is the EOSC marketplace and which are the benefits that uh, um, this uh, uh, infrastructure can give to service providers. 
And uh, I'd leave the stage to Gaston and Joshua, thanking them again for the availability uh, to do this webinar today. So I interrupt the sharing of my screen and please Gaston, Joshua, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Luca. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with uh, the first session and then I'll hand over to Joshua. So Luca mentioned already triple and, and onboarding. So if we think about the triple project in the wider ecosystem, I mean, it's about building a multilingual and multicultural discovery solution for the social sciences and humanities, a single access point um, to explore, find, access, and reuse both literature, data projects, but also researcher profiles across Europe. And as we've heard, it's part of the European Open Science Cloud. There are synergies with the social sciences and humanities open cloud. Uh, and the Go Triple platform will be provided by the OPERA's infrastructure. So what does any of this have to do with onboarding to the EOS portal? Um, and in a very simple way, it's the first step towards integration with EOS. By having the service listed in the EOS portal, you're increasing the visibility to the service. That is, at the very least, to funders and other EOS partners. But obviously the idea is that in the future, this central platform or the other platforms connected to it will also enable the researchers to find your services, making sure that they can find them. And I've mentioned there are others, Luca mentioned it, the shock uh, marketplace. There will be multiple platforms and all of these platforms are already talking to each other. And it seems the default, at least in our community, will be that you onboard to the EOS portal and then it will automatically appear in the domain specific or in the regional portals that are being built. Now I say it's the first step because having listed the service is one thing, but what you actually of course want is having some sort of interoperability, having connections between the services, making it possible for your researchers, for your users to go from one service to the other. And what is it that you can onboard? Well, there are some uh, restrictions, it has to be mature uh, services, mature resources with some wider form of applicability that should be for users across countries or across domains. But it doesn't reclude this. I mean, you can always have a service that's only targeted to specific geographic location. It can also be services that are targeted to specific scientific domains because many services of course are. And the whole process works through the EOS portal um, that's the central website, and that is a service that is being developed and provided through the EOSC Enhanced project. And uh, Luca mentioned this as well. Fester is also a member of this EOSC Enhanced project, and this is why we're um, using our EOSC Enhanced training material here also. Um, so let me sort of switch the head uh, to EOSC Enhanced and briefly explain to you what the project does. Um, it follows up from previous projects, in particular, the EOS Pilot, EOS Hub, and eInfraCentral projects, who were all working on central catalogs. <clears throat> and it's a two-year project that uh, is already way into its second year. Um, and its main focus is to develop this portal, making the portal itself uh, more accessible and more usable for those who rely upon it. There's four aspects on it. One is uh, enhancing the service provider interface, so making it easier for service providers to become in, to come into the portal. <clears throat> um, increasing the user demand, making it easier for users to find your services and also then access your services. Um, accelerating the whole process, um, we see that later or both on a technical level where we've now moved from Excel sheets to online submission solutions, but also this kind of training event, making sure that people know how to onboard their services and help with this process. And finally, of course, making it possible for research to happen, enabling open access to the services across the thematic clouds, um, lifting the clouds or seeing the sky, the open sky. There's some 
central key exploitable results to the project. There is the, the portal and its APIs, the processes, uh, the number of training materials, uh, the technical metadata description in behind it, the EOS portal profiles. These are the sort of abstract metadata schema that describe the assets and uh, services that are in the portal. And they are being used across in the other domains and the other services as well. Um, <clears throat> there's also the possibility for providers. We see that later um, to find out more about their services from within the EOS portal. And finally, the whole concept of turning it into some form of marketplace where providers can interact with users and or customers. So if you now think that sounds like a good idea, we should onboard, then of course the next question is what do you actually have to do in order to be able to do this? So how do you prepare? Well, first of all, what, who can actually provide services in EOSC? Um, and at the very basic level, it has to be a legal entity that intends to offer the service and will serve as the main contact point. They have to make some form of commitment for the service and they have to agree to the EOS privacy policy and other policies and they have to provide help desk channels um, to allow users to communicate with you, with that provider, um, if there are problems with the service. And what is such an EOSC service or a resource in the more broader sense? And I apologize for uh, repeatedly using the word service, but it should be more broader. It should be a resource in general. Um, although the focus here is more on services for the time being. So EOS resources can be any sort of asset that's made available to the whole of EOSC and for all of the EOSC end users. Um, the most important thing is it's some sort of offering that's happening continuously, live in a way. Um, and that can be services. It can also be data sources. It can also be objects and uh, trainings and other kinds of assets that are being delivered. For all of these resources, there should be an SLA in place, a service level agreement. They should meet the EASC maturity classification. Um, the links are in the slides. This maturity classification is also repeating some of the things we're saying here. So they will also tell you that you need to have uh, some kind of support mechanism, that you need to have SLAs and so on. It should be offered in European languages, um, most of the time English as a default and uh, other European languages as well. And there should be some form of uh, exit strategy providing your users an option to leave your service if the need ever arises. And there exist profiles, and we'll briefly talk about them, or well, not so briefly talk about them in a minute, that describe what information is actually needed when you actually do want to provide, to onboard your resource. So what are the steps to do? Quite surprisingly, in many cases, the most important step is identifying who the provider is, that legal entity I mentioned earlier, who will be that entity? Because in projects, this can sometimes be a bit fuzzy. Um, we've heard it earlier, Operas will be the infrastructure providing the triple, the Go triple platform, but that's not always as clear cut and sometimes there needs to be discussions around this. Um, and it's also sometimes a bit tricky if you are an, we call it an embedded uh, organization within an institution like a laboratory within a university and so on. And sometimes it's not entirely clear who exactly will be offering the service. Once that has been clarified, um, you need some form of commitment on the service um, in terms of responsibilities, right? You need someone to take care of the service through its life cycle when there are updates needed and so on. You need someone to answer help desk queries if users are running into problems. There should be some form of plan of where this service is going. Will there be development? What new functionalities will be added over time and when? Um, technology has to be continuously upgraded. In particular, web services uh, with, with technology evolving, security measures uh, having to be up, uh, implemented. There's always work to be done. So there should be some form of commitment on personnel and ultimately financial. 
And of course, you need to have documentation, both internally for providing the service, but also for the user who uses the service and relies upon it. Um, once you have this clear commitment and what the number is may depend, but then you have to understand what are the actual questions that will be asked during this process. We'll talk about them. And then you prepare these answers because usually if you're the one person coordinating that process, you won't be able to ask every to answer every single question that's being asked. So it will often be necessary to help to talk to others. And the final step then is to actually fill out the online form and submit. So when I say support um, from the provider, there is of course the management buy-in if you want. You need someone to say who's gonna be the authorized person to do this, who is gonna be the one representing us towards EOSC, but also setting this commitment that I mentioned, having, some, having a commitment that there will be people available or time available or money available for the foreseeable future. Um, to make sure this service can actually be delivered. And then you need to talk to some people who know something about communications because you need to promote your service. You need to have attractive descriptions that actually catch the attention and describe the service in a way that the target audience will understand what it does. And that's important to talk to some user representatives to understand, and I mean, I'm assuming you already do that, that you know who you're, who you're providing the service to and that you're providing end user documentation to understand and make sensible use of the service. But very often this is looked at as a, this onboarding process is looked as a technical problem where it isn't. It's very much a problem that's in the, it's an organizational problem or administrative problem. You have to figure out what these answers are. Some of the answers that you have to give are technical, but some of them are very much on communications and others are, uh, what is your service level agreement? So these are examples of the questions that they look like. These are Excel files that exist that you can download and look at and discuss with the various people in your institution to figure out what the correct answer in each of these cases are. You don't have to fill them in. You will only need to fill in the online submission form, but they can help you prepare those questions where you don't need to know the answer to because it's not very helpful if you start the process and then have to talk someone from every single page you go through in the process. Um, so it's better to prepare this in advance. And we will see later that it's a multiple step process. So having prepared multiple steps, uh, all steps in advance is also very good. So what are questions that you'll be being asked about your provider? Well, the simple things like the name of your legal entity, as I said earlier, that's the first thing to figure out. Providing the website, explaining what the legal status is, is it an independent organization, is it embedded within a larger entity like a university and so on? Who are the people to be contacted, the administrators? The description of your provider, your logo to be shown in the marketplace and so on. And there's also some sort of classifications on which domains you're working in, what tax apply to your institution. And we come to the resource, the questions are in a way similar. There's questions of what's the name, what is the research organization, the provider, or is it maybe more than just one organization? There's cases where uh, federation, where services are offered through federations and there's multiple institutions to be named. Um, you need this marketing information, the description of the resource, you need a logo for the resource, you need a tagline. This is the one sentence that will uh, be used to promote the service in most uh, short summaries. Um, you need the classification according to scientific domains, to categories, to target user description, and so on. And then you need the management part of it, um, how to reach your help desk, where your user manual is, where you've defined your privacy policy, where your terms of use are, what your service level agreement is, and what sort of maintenance plan you have. And with that, I'm handing off to Joshua, who will walk us through the actual step-by-step -step process. Thank you very much, Kasten. Let me quickly share my screen. So um, thank you very much, Kasten, once again. Um, so once, uh, Customer has taken us through the preparation of onboarding. 
and indeed, once you are uh, adequately prepared to and identify who the provider is, and also manage to understand the attributes of the of of the profiles um, that you needed to enter, and then you then have to go onto the online portal of EOS online portal to fill in uh, to to go through the onboarding process. So the onboarding process has to Two, uh, two ways you can onboard a resource onto EOS. You can either do that by the web interface and also by API, which we will go through each one of them. And then um, as part of the presentation, we will also take you through what you do as well as you onboard some of the things that you have to do with the provider's dashboard and some actions that you need to to do or you need to, uh, or you will get some of the benefits that you get from the dashboard. We will also go through that as well. So um, the onboarding process, uh, process has three phases. So the first phase is that you, you as an authorized uh, user of the organization, uh, you will need to register onto the EOS port, uh, portal. And then the next phase is that you then on, uh, onboard the, your organization as a provider. And then the third phase is then once that is done and it's been approved, everything is well, you then have you then have the chance to onboard either onboard either through the web portal or to the API. And each of these all this each of these phases goes through each of these phases there are validation. So they are either validation by the system, which uh, for example URL validation or some mandatory fields that you need to fill validation. There's a self-validation by the provider as well um, to check if uh, things that is being entered uh, represent what exactly the resources or the provider is, which is, and then there's a third validation that's also be done, especially if you are onboarding your resource for the very first time and also onboarding your provider. Uh, there's some validation that needs to be uh, conducted by the onboarding team. So in the first phase, uh, registering of, uh, of a user or, or, or a user representative, you, you go on to EOX portal, uh, eox-portal.eu, and then you click on the providers uh, uh, section. It takes you to provider section and then uh, it goes you it takes you through the process on how you can become a provider so you 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 click on the start it takes you to start and then you then have to uh, authenticate or register using uh, either a social or your institutional uh, federated uh, AI mechanism so once that you done you can now then log on to the eox portal as who you think who you are. And then um, you would then have to accept some uh, terms and condition, uh, EOS private, uh, privacy policy, which uh, outline what EOS da does with your data and all, and all that. And, there could, and, and then a code of conduct, which also explains uh, some of the obligation of a user and some of the processes that uh, I, I, some of the on um, onboarding processes and uh, and that uh, you will have to go through. Then the second phase is now that you are registered. You now you now have the opportunity to onboard your to onboard your your organization as a provider. So uh, as Kastin already uh, mentioned, uh, if you are adequately prepared you know exactly what you need to enter onto, onto the forms, onto the forms and then you have various discussion uh, with your, within your organization as to what information that you need. Then filling the form is just a straightforward thing. You just, uh, you, uh, you just enter or transfer all those information that you've actually adequately prepared within the organization onto, onto the online onto the online form. So once the online form is being completed, you submit, um, you submit and then a notification is being sent to the onboarding team. The onboarding team just takes a look at it, validate all your entries. 
in case there are any issues with your your there are any issues with your your forms that have been uh, submitted uh, the onboarding team gets back to you with the issues and then help you to uh, correct them so when when that is done um, it was also send you um, an email in the form of what you see on the screen that uh, your provider is now fully registered so once your product provider is it's register you now move on to the phase, phase, phase C, which is the registration of your first resource. So in registry of your first resource, as we can see, if your, if your provider is approved, you will see it as we are, as SESTA, as Kasten said, we are partners of uh, EOX Enhanced in the project. We are also a provider. So as you can see, SESTA is a provider where we've been We've onboarded our provider and it has been approved. So once it has been approved, you can click on, on that. It navigates you onto a dashboard. We will talk a bit more about the dashboard later on. But at the dashboard, uh, there are two ways of, of which you can um, um, on onboard, onboard a resource. You can onboard a resource uh, using the web, which we will, we will go through that. But at the later part, we will also go through how you can also onboard your resource using the REST API. So once uh, you using the web, you click on the new uh, new resource to then enter a, a form, online form of a resource. Again, if you are adequately prepared, you know information about your resource and everything, then this uh, entry of this form is just a few minutes, takes a few minutes because you are already prepared, you know the information that you need to enter. So once that is done, once you fill in the form, you submit, you submit the form and then it goes onto the onboarding uh, a notification. Uh, the entire form goes into the onboarding team. They do a bit of validation. Again, since it's a first resource, there's a bit of validation that needs to be done by the onboarding team to make sure that you understood the profile and and its specifications. So uh, if everything is done, you will also, the administrators within the, pro, within the provider's profile uh, will receive an email in um, example, as well as what you see on the screen, indicating that your first resource has been uh, accepted and then it has been listed onto the EOS catalog. So the EOS catalog, uh, so once it's been listed on TX Atlas, that actually ends the user journey of the onboarding process. So the onboarding process ends when once your, your resource has been listed onto the EOS marketplace or the EOS catalog. And then from, from uh, henceforth, uh, you can then once you've registered or onboard your first resource, you can add additional resource as a, as, a, as, a, as a provider, either via the web and also via the API. Like I said, we will take a look at how uh, it can be done with the API later on. So, uh, short a while. So uh, with, uh, using that, so with much as I do, I move on to onboarding onto the API. So the API, I, I, like we said, uh, helps um, uh, providers, developers to programmatically uh, interact with the EOS catalog. So interacting with your catalogs example, as we can see on the screen, we have uh, like a third party resource catalog consumer. Uh, it can either um, uh, retrieve information or add information onto the EOS uh, portal. So um, as Kasten already said, or as Lucas already said, uh, shock will be, uh, you in, will be also be interacting with uh, the EOS portal, uh, you, or you will be interacting with the EOS portal as, as, a, as a third party uh, catalog. So how do we, then uh, uh, use the EOX uh, Porter API. So there are three three steps that you need, we needed to take. First of all, uh, uh, 
you need to register as a as a as a provider or a representative of the provider and then you you should onboard your your provider and also onboard your first resource so within all those phases there will be a lot of validations and then a lot of uh, uh, quality assurance uh, processes that will go through that so once that is done then uh, uh, as a representative you can then go on to the AI portal to 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 obtain uh, a, uh, a, to a, to obtain a credential or to obtain a token based on your credential um, registered with the AI mechanism. So once that is uh, once you have that, you can then you can then use uh, the betos. We will take a look at some of them shortly, uh, um, provided by the API documentation to uh, interact either to retrieve from the catalog or to update the catalog. So the first step, um, like I said, uh, you will, it's uh, a prerequisite. So you don't just onboard directly, you will first need to be known by the system. So uh, you will have to onboard as a provider and also uh, onboard a first resource which uh, ensure that there's a, a, a qualified population where you, onto the EOX portal. So uh, that, that step needs to be uh, completed once. Once that is done, then you, you, you can now uh, go ahead and then obtain your token and then uh, try to use uh, the documentation provided for you to uh, on board using the API. Now, second sta stage, like I said, you will uh, you have to log on onto, onto the AI portal and then you request for your uh, API token. The API token uh, is not persistent. It has a time limit. It's uh, eight hours. Uh, it lasts for eight hours. But then if you have, if you have the token, you can now interact with the catalog. Uh, uh, you can now interact by, uh, with the catalog uh, by pushing information using the put or push method, uh, which generally uh, you will need the token for. But in most cases, if you are retrieving from the catalog, you don't really require the token. The test, the test step is then using the method. Uh, so in using the method, the, the, the API is the, uses a, a SSL, uh, which is a HTTPS uh, protocol. And then it has a base, uh, uh, it has a base URL, and then it just follow specification and then the method that we have. So once that is being entered or that, that that is being sent or the call is being made, the, the request is being re re retained either in the JSON format or in the XML format, as you can see on the screen. Using the API, um, there are three methods of using the API. We have the get method, uh, which retrieve information from the EOX portal. We have the post, which create or validate a new resource that has been entered. And then we have the put which up, update an existing resource on, on, on the portal. And then if you, if, you, if you go onto the portal documentation, which is in the Swagger form, you will, you will then find out that there are certain specific uh, controllers. For, so for example, they are Providers controllers which uh, groups all the methods under the provider resource, and then we have the resource uh, controller which also group all the methods or or the calls that you have to make, uh, or the or, or the calls that you have to make into the catalog uh, uh, that you will then use for your interaction with the catalog. 
um, to insert your resource. So for example, if we want to register a new resource onto, onto, uh, onto the catalog, we will need to insert uh, a, a profile, the profile that Kasten uh, talked about earlier. Uh, but that is in the form of a JSON uh, format. And then uh, it actually matches uh, the current uh, specification uh, portal, which is in the version 3.0. So as the API is updated, anytime the profile is updated, at the moment it's in 3.0, in the few months time, it will be updated to 4.0, and then the API will also be updated uh, accordingly. Uh, but one of the things that we will also have to say that the API is an inversion. It means that there's a back compatibility, which also uh, work for the previous methods or previous resources. And then uh, uh, the, the resource is represented in JSON format and must adhere, like I said, to the EOX portal profile. And then the EOX portal call uh, several API methods that are that we will see in the next uh, section. So um, this is a bit of information that you will, uh, you will need if you want to do or uh, interact with uh, the EOX portal or the EOX catalog. The, uh, so with the uh, EOX portal API, it can be found here. And then but there are various environments that you can also uh, you, uh, you, use, uh, of course, the production. Uh, when you are doing a production, then you should be aware that uh, anything that you do with the production changes are done directly onto the, pub, on, onto the public or the EOS catalog. And again, if you want to test uh, some of the API methods that we have with the EOS, you can go to the sandbox, which is exact replica of the production. But the only difference is that it doesn't uh, update the catalog. So you can test and play around with it if you want to. The beta, then we have the beta environment, which um, in case there's a new releases or new versions, uh, we test them with the beta. You, we can also use the beta to test new releases and then see if it suits uh, our use cases. Um, we now move to the uh, EOX provider's dashboard. So yes, once the onboarding is done, then uh, the EOX provider's dashboard give us the overview of all the things that, or, uh, overview of all your resource and then your, uh, your provider's profile and what you can do with them. You can either update them, you can see some statistics about your resources, you can see, uh, you can, uh, update your provider's profile. You can update any resources that you have. So that's uh, the EOS dashboard gives us a, a your overview of what you can do with your resources and then your uh, 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 your provider's profile. We will see example of some of them uh, uh, shortly. So if you go into the EOS uh, provider's dashboard overview, like I said, um, you can monitor the status of your onboarding. You can manage a resource uh, portfolio within your uh, within the EOS catalog. You can filter or review any information that you have in your resource uh, in your resource profile. You can also view some of the users engagement that you have uh, with your with your users or or the users of the resources. So um, if you go under that dashboard, there are a couple of actions that you, you can take. Um, you can, you can uh, aggregate the provider's uh, resources. You, um, you can also aggregate by, by the resource. You can, uh, like, like we've done previously, you can onboard a resource onto the public or a catalog. You can also try to have it in the draft form and then later on, uh, you submit it if you want. Uh, you could also uh, update the provider's prof uh, profile and also update the resource profile. 
and then there's a link that can also navigate you into uh, API in case you want to use the API to onboard your resource. Much more things that you can do um, in terms of uh, user track activities. Um, um, there are some basic web analytics of your, of your resource when you board them, such as a uh, number of uh, addition of project that you have, you have, you have added over time, uh, number, number of, uh, number of uh, um, users that have visited your site over time, and then, then number of your, uh, then you can get detailed list of your resource distribution of your target users. Uh, you can also, it also gives you timeline of uh, the administrators update of a resource. So if you have various administrators update of resource, this kind of uh, audit trade that gives you uh, what has happened to the resource, uh, any update gives you a bit timeline and then a detail of what actually are the updates that has been done on the resource. A bit of more information that you need. So for more information about profiles, dashboards uh, are here. Uh, more information about the uh, provider's documentation can also be seen here uh, on the board. And then they, we, we have links uh, where you can also promote your 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 EOS uh, resource or service as as Sesta has uh, done recently. So there's an article on that where Sesta uh, where we were able to uh, promote its its resources. That was a bit helpful for, to us. So there's more information about that, and then you can also submit your EOS related news or events, and then uh, and the link on how you become provider. Um, thank you very much. And then uh, we wait for any further uh, questions that you may, you may have. We are ready to give answers to them. Thank you. Thanks, Karsten. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, let's officially start the Q&A session. There is uh, uh, just a question from the audience. So the question is, I didn't understand the steps to be able to use the API. Before using the API, is it mandatory to have at least one resource registered? Step one of the list with the creation of the provider. Why is that? Why can't I create a resource directly via the API? This is for Joshua, I guess. Oh yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the steps is, uh, the most important thing is, is that, uh, in order for you to, uh, uh, in order for you to onboard a resource using the API, we should be able to know who you are. We should have your information on the system, and then we should be you should be able to uh, uh, we should be able to validate, uh, or the onboarding team need to validate uh, all the attributes that you've actually entered within. Uh, using the web. So once that is done and then we know who you are and then we know that you actually understood what, what, what you have to do with the, with the profiles, then uh, you are then given the license to then uh, onboard onto, onto, the, onto the EOS uh, 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 using the API. And more importantly, it's because you would need to be registered uh, onto the portal, which we have to know who you are. So that's, that's the main reason why uh, you, the first stage or the first step is so important to, 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 to us, yeah. That's also, I mean, you explained it also when you do it via the online uh, form, also the very first submission will get a review by the onboarding team. And this is kind of the process that's also being enforced for the API. For the first time, there is a review, and that is not to make sure that you're not trying to sell fake uh, designer handbags, which was apparently the case in the early days of the portal, um, that people tried to submit that kind of uh, service offering. 
but it's more on making sure that you're understanding the model and that your description is uh, sensible and that you filled out uh, the things correctly. Because ultimately, if you're using the API, the assumption is you would only invest in doing that if you're planning to do large updates, and then it's important that they're right from the start. Okay, so first of all, if there are other questions, so please keep on posting them in the chat. In the meanwhile, I have other questions for you guys. And uh, the question is, which is, in your um, opinion, the right granula granularity for a resource to be unlisted in the marketplace? Because at present, there are, let's say, big projects and also small services. Is there any ideal um, yeah, dimension of, uh, of the service that a provider can uh, publish? So there's no official uh, answer on that. It's uh, ultimately up to the provider. The idea is, of course, that any service that can be used in a way on its own is probably worth onboarding because every single one of that services is a service that a researcher, a user can use. Um, there may be cases where it becomes beneficial to put multiple of them together. Um, but still, if the single service is useful to researchers, it's probably good to onboard it. I mentioned it earlier, there's the question of having this visibility to funders, which as simple as it is, it is always important to be visible and to be part of the EOS. And this is the very first step in, in doing this and becoming available. And uh, ultimately, it we hope that this will serve to attract new users to your services. And then the more innovative and more specialized the service is, the higher the chance they will find it through this. Of course, the other side of this is that uh, there will be lots of uh, services and uh, how do you find the right thing? This is something we haven't touched upon. This is currently being worked on. There is a recommender system coming up that is supposed to facilitate exactly these kind of workflows. Okay, thanks, uh, Kirsten, because actually you touched the uh, next two questions. Uh, the, the first question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, visibility at present is the main added value of being enlisted in the US marketplace, but also in slide three, you mentioned the follow-up steps like interoperability, connection, interaction, etc. So uh, is there any other uh, things in the future in the you know roadmap that will uh, allow a service provider to um, have other kind of functionalities out of the US marketplace. Mm. So I mean the marketplace as in the portal the way we've presented it now that's based on the EOS enhanced project funding cycle which ends in six months. So there isn't that many more significant things to be expected here. The recommender system is, as far as I'm aware, the last big thing that the Enhance will deliver. But um, <clears throat> of course, work will continue in other projects. The EOS Future project uh, is taking these on. Um, and we're moving more into a way of understanding this as a whole uh, platform or collaboration hub. And there are other services provided by EOS that will be usable, such as, I mean, I mentioned the help desk part, uh, and obviously you will need to have people who answer the questions. But when it comes to the question of how do I do that? What software do I use? Do I do this via email? Do I buy a license for a commercial project and so on? There will be a solution by EOS that you can uh, just get uh, and use that as the technical part of it. You still have to answer, but there's a system that allows you to exchange the tickets. Um, and this provider dashboard that Joshua mentioned is closely connected to also the internal um, monitoring system, the internal software stack that is used to manage all the entries in the catalog. That's ultimately the same technology that the e-infrastructures are already using in-house to maintain their service portfolios. So it's a possibility to use that for your own and then you automatically get the API connectivity. I mean, this is one of the big use cases where this is coming from, but there are also others um, that want to onboard large quantities of services from, for instance, regional projects. Okay, so if I understood correctly, there are some new services that uh, can be exploited and 
the, the roadmap is still a moving target, let's say. Some of these are defined, but some might come next when the new project, for example, or get funded. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, another question is a bit controversial because I would like to move the perspective from the service provider to the user. So uh, in your um, experience, which is the typical user of the EOSC marketplace so far? Not so the intended user, but uh, the one that uh, actually has used uh, the, the portal until now. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, of course, the, the, the controversial. I, I think what, what we're missing at the moment is that this portal is not really something that a researcher would go to to find a service. Um, that is certainly the case, but that's something that's well understood and what we're trying to work on. Um, I think at the moment it's more within infrastructures or within the bigger players in Europe to figure out what others have and how these things might to connect. Um, we started looking, as Sesta started looking at the EOS portal already some time ago when we're trying to figure out, okay, we're a research infrastructure for the social sciences, we don't want to do everything, where can we find solutions like an existing AI for, uh, technology stack that we can just get uh, from the market as in from another provider within EOS. And I think for now, this is one of the use cases that really exists. Um, that representatives of infrastructures of research performing institutions that are already active in EOS can see what others have. And of course, at the very least, it's an option to show off the innovative services and maybe find if others at other research institutions know you have an interesting service that might very well provide you um, with a query that might lead to a future funding project. Okay, so I have a, a, one last question and then there, will, there are a couple of other questions from the audience. Uh, mine is quite short. So I just tested, of course, these days the US marketplace and I've seen uh, the projects functionality, but it isn't entirely clear to me what is the purpose of having uh, the, the, the projects that, uh, so if you can uh, present it uh, quickly. Apparently, me as a uh, user, I can ask. Right, please, Joshua. Uh, the, the question for I can... uh, Sorry, the, the purpose of the EOSC Enhanced project. Uh, no, as a user, I can, yeah. uh, as a user of the marketplace, I yeah. can create a project and add services to, the, to this project that I created. So it's a functionality that the marketplace provides to the users. And uh, if you can present it. Uh, apparently something like uh, you can group projects together and uh, see the status of the request if you need to you know, access these, uh, these services, but it wasn't entirely clear to me. But I suppose I'm not the only one to be confused by these features. Mm, no, so I literally can't explain that functionality, no. Okay, so uh, let's keep and let's go to the other questions coming from the audience. So uh, this one, I guess, for Joshua, because it's the follow up of the other one. So, okay, if I understood correctly, I need to register one resource with the web interface so that the, the onboarding team can validate it and so they can trust me. Then I can use the API to create 10 more services and they won't be double checked by the onboarding team. Is this uh, the case? Yes, that is the case. But uh, beyond that, uh, there is uh, um, validation that uh, the EOS onboarding team does uh, uh, regularly. So um, randomly, they go through all your resources and then see if everything is right, and then they notify you. Um, uh, and also, as part of uh, quality assurance, the 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 ones they want to go through your your resource that you onboard if there's anything that is missing or anything that has not been well represented in your resources they notify you um going forward there there's uh, there's a, a big requirement that we uh, yet to be implemented uh, in us to automate some of these uh, uh, 
validation notifications. So for example, if uh, uh, you haven't touched your resource or you have not updated your resource for over a year, and then and a notification, for example, will be sent to you to review and then and then go through your resource to that your your current information about the resource is being uh, incorrectly updated. Okay, and another question, uh, a very good one in my viewpoint is, uh, are there any fees attached to being a service provider on the EOS portal? No, at the moment, no. Okay, cool. <laughs> and, uh, but it is possible to have services in the EOS uh, portal that are themselves require uh, or, or cost money. Um, although, I mean, the official EOS rule is that it has to be free at the point of view, so you can't charge the individual researcher, but it's still possible to offer, say, storage or computing powers to a larger institution that buys this on bulk for their researchers. So these kind of services exist and they are very much possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can it be also a freemium model? Like, for example, it's free up to a certain point, and then if you need advanced functionalities, you have to pay a fee. Yeah, that's part of the uh, EOSC participation rules um, that have been defined by the EOSC Working Group last year and are now being taken on by the EOSC Association and revised. And I can't comment on the specific detail because I literally don't know, but um, the general idea is that it should not be the researcher that's getting charged individually. It should always be, or if there are fees, it should be covered somewhere on an institutional level. All right, that, that's interesting. And that's complicated for a commercial service provider, I might say. Yeah. 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 Okay, another question from the audience uh, regarding the connection between the EOS portal and the shock open marketplace. I didn't really understand whether the shock open marketplace is integrated in or harvested by the EOS portal. And if so, are there overlaps in the available resources? Yeah, so I put up this, uh, this slide again. Um, the shock marketplace will not be harvested by the EOS portal, it's the other way around. Um, so the shock marketplace will harvest from the EOS portal based on certain filters. Um, so, for instance, if a service in the EOS portal is defined as being in the social sciences or humanities science domain, then this will show up in the shock marketplace. There will be some form of um, editorial step in between that will add or remove certain um, other services, but the general idea is all services that are in the EOS portal uh, should and relevant to social sciences and humanities, they shall become visible in the shock open marketplace. And if they're updated in the EOS portal, they will automatically be updated in the shock marketplace. So these services should be onboarded to the EOS portal instead. That's why on, on this side, we have, in a way on the left, we have the research providers, but also the thematic and regional catalogs. They're mentioned on the left um, because they would onboard their uh, services to the e science cloud, but then display them for the user in their um, resource catalogs again. So this is a bit, it looks like a bit of double, but it, uh, the user facing side is uh, at least in shock only on the right. There are other clusters who are thinking of this slightly differently, um, but within shock, um, we've taken the approach that we don't foresee a need to duplicate uh, the service management side. Um, the shock marketplace has a different focus from the EOS portal, a wider focus. Uh, we don't have as strict rules on the service maturity to get included. That's why we're harvesting that way around. Because of course, services that have a high maturity are very welcome in the shock marketplace, but the other way around is not necessarily the case. Um, and that's why our Shock Marketplace is this kind of portal on the right, and, and to get there, you onboard to the EOSC portal. You don't necessarily do this for smaller things like your individual Python script that gets onboarded through other ways or your data set that gets directly onboarded. Okay, so this was the last question. Um, I don't know if uh, 
is there any other um, uh, feedback from uh, the audience? It seems uh, nothing is coming. So, Kasten and Joshua, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, Francesca, I guess that the floor is yours for the official ending of the webinar. Yes, thank you, Luca. I really want to thank you all, the three of, of you, <laughs> for this, uh, for the organization and this presentation which I think is really useful for the triple project, for our tasks we are expected to, to yeah, deliver in the next month. So thanks again and uh, see you at the next uh, training event, uh, the 29th of June at two o'clock. Uh, thank you again. Have a nice day. <laughs>